Welcome back to High School Economics. This is Dr. Kling. And today we're going to talk about GDP and the standard of living. We use GDP in a couple of ways. In macroeconomics, or the basic macroeconomics, we use GDP to measure economic activity. And again, I insist that that's outsourcing. So we're using it as a measure of all the outsourcing in the economy. Another way it's sometimes is used is to measure the standard of living. Standard of living. And there we use typically GDP per capita. So, GDP divided by population. And today I'm going to focus on this second issue, that is measuring the standard of living and what GDP measures tell us about how the standard of living has changed over time and how it differs across countries. So first, let me take you to a chart. This is from a book written by economic historian Gregory Clark. The book is called A Farewell to Alms. And what <coughs> he claims is that this chart gives you all of economic history in one chart. So first, the, the horizontal axis is measuring time in years, and it's long time. It goes from 1000 BC up to 2000 AD, so up to recent times. And you notice for, and this is income per person on average <coughs> um, with an index of 1800 equals 1. So uh, if, you know, if we're in 1800, we're at that a point where we're sort of measuring income per unit as 1, which is sort of a weird number. It might, we'll get to some actual numerical measures uh, in a moment. Okay, so, and I, I think it's, it'll be about $250 is my recollection, but we'll, we'll see that in a moment. But the point is, if you go from 1000 BC here, all the way over to 1800, you basically get no change. And he calls this the Malthusian trap. Okay, that we, all the, <laughs> improvements in technology and in organization of the economy simply went to increase population, but the average well standard of living of individuals did not go up. Um, there was some increased inequality. You had some very, very wealthy people once the agricultural revolution kicked in, which it had kicked in by 1000 B.C., so that you could have some very wealthy people who owned lots of land because they had presumably lots of military power. But, <clears throat> but most people were quite poor, and again, on average, nothing happened until 1800, and you get, then you get the Industrial Revolution and this big takeoff in economic growth in the Industrial Revolution. And he calls this period the Great Divergence, because some countries did not and still not have not experienced this takeoff in growth that took place in the Industrial Revolution. So point number one is this thing that we call the Industrial Revolution was a really big deal. And let me talk a bit more about that. This is a table from another book, a book by Brad DeLong. It's his, uh, his macroeconomics textbook. I think it's a graduate textbook. Maybe he thinks that undergraduates could follow it, but it's pretty mathematical. Anyway, the table shows GDP uh, per person starting in the year 5000 BC and going up to 2000 AD. And what you see is this, a lot of this pattern that Gregory Clark noticed, that is that GDP per person 
doesn't do much for several hundred years, but then <clears throat> by 1800 we start to see this pick up, and then it then it more than triples from the 250 to 850 in 1900, and then it can <clears throat> more than doubles in just 50 years, and then more than doubles in 25 years, and almost doubles in the following 25 years. So this is average per person, so it includes all countries, even countries that are not developed. I think in the U.S. by this point in 2000, we would probably be uh, well over 20,000, maybe 30,000 per person. But even if you average in all the poor countries in the world, we're at 8,000 by the year $8,000 by the year 2000, whereas we'd only been at $250 per person 200 years earlier. Now, what does that mean in terms of specifics? Um, so let me show you what things looked like in 1895. And this is the Frederick Douglass Mansion. And Frederick Douglass, by this point in 1895, was one of the wealthiest men in America. So he had a, this, a mansion that you can still tour today. And I just want to, want to list some of the wonderful things he had in his house. And then what a typical person, even a relatively poor household, would have instead today. So he had a rug beater so that you could beat rugs. Uh, now we have a vacuum cleaner. He had chamber pots that uh, servants would empty when, uh, well, when we won't, when he would use the toilet, what we would now call a toilet. Now we have flush toilets. And he had this really fancy thing, a one cubic foot ice box, where you would put ice in part of it, and then you could put some cold food in the other part. It was one cubic foot. Now there's, of course, refrigerator freezers that are 16 cubic feet or more. They had a washboard so that they could beat their washing. They could wash clothes. Of course, now we have a washing machine. They had this a clothes wringer. That was interesting to see how you used to wring out clothes by pulling them through these rollers. Um, now we have a dryer. There were many irons in the Douglas Mansion for ironing clothes. Of course, now we have permanent press. There was an indoor well so that uh, you didn't have to go outside to draw water. That was really fancy. Of course, we take uh, modern plumbing for granted. We had a kerosene lamp. We now use electricity. And something called a dry sink for washing dishes, and we use a dishwasher. And this is just over a hundred years ago, and you could not live in the environment a hundred years ago. You wouldn't be able to deal with all the difficulties and challenges and th of living even like a rich person a hundred years ago. So that's another measure, another indication of how powerful the economic growth it has been since the Industrial Revolution. One of the challenges with comparing the standard of living today with the standard of living hundreds of years ago is that the nature of the goods and services that we consume is so much different. But flour from wheat <coughs> is fairly similar to what flour was several hundred years ago. So Here's a, another quote from Brad DeLong that, let me see if I can, I can't bring it up here, but that basically if you took a bag of flour today that you can buy for 69 cents, that might have taken several days of work to get uh, back in 1500. So if you think of getting taking several days to get of work to get what you can now get for 69 cents, which you can get for you know, maybe a, a tenth of an hour of work, you can see just how much wealthier we are. In fact, by the, the bags of flour standard, Brad DeLong estimates we're about 430 times wealthier than people living in 1500. But I mentioned that uh, there are still our under undeveloped countries, and uh, Greg Clark calls this the last 200 years the great divergence because uh, the standard of living has really started to, to diverge across countries. If you, some countries became much wealthier than others. 
And this is a book that was put out by the World Bank about five years ago called Where is the Wealth of Nations? And here's a table that shows how they answer that question, where is the wealth of nation? They divide the countries into low-income countries, middle-income countries, and high-income countries. And they talk about <clears throat> natural capital, which is their natural resources. So if you had a lot of oil, uh, that would be good. If you had a lot of uh, good cropland, that would be good natural capital. They have produced capital, so that's those are, that's the factories and the equipment that you've built up over the years to produce things, but you had to produce that capital. And then there's intangible capital, which is sort of <coughs> whatever is left over that accounts for the wealth of the country. And you notice that there's some divergence in all three categories. That is, the high-income countries have more natural capital than the low-income countries. They have more produced capital. But look at this number, the intangible capital. That's really where a lot of the difference lies between the high-income countries and the low-income countries. And in fact, intangible capital accounts for, according to the World Bank, 78% of the total capital in the world, and the high-income countries have the most of it. So our second point is that there's been this great divergence So of a growing apart between the uh, highly developed countries and the less developed countries. And the third point is that there are these intangible factors that account for this. And the two, there are two types of intangible factors. The first is what we call might call ideas, invention, and business organization. So these are thing these are the things that have created the high standard of living in the advanced economies. Just the the use of science and technology and efficient business organization have are what have produced are the intangible factors that have produced the high standard of living. And what's holding back the less developed countries, and some of what's holding back is the lack of natural and physical capital, but a lot of the impediment is bad government. I mean, and I'm talking about really bad government. I mean, government that steals. So the, um, the rulers are basically taking whatever wealth gets created in the society and therefore not a whole lot is going to get created. Uh, and also you'll see cultural resistance to learning. So if you have a culture that doesn't allow women to go to school or a culture where innovation is highly suspect and rejected, or a culture that uh, doesn't put much respect into work, that respects people who don't have to work. So these are some of the intangible factors that hold, uh, that hold economies back. So this is a very interesting topic of sort of why the standard of living has diverged over the last 200 years, in particular the explosion in the quality of the standard of living in the developed economies. Uh, it's something you can read more about, and I would encourage you to read more about, but that'll be it for this talk.